Well, it's good to see everybody. I have, but I, I just uh, do one more quick prayer and pray that God uh, um, uses this time now to speak to us. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, you do speak, that you're not dumb. You speak really clearly. And Lord, I pray that right now as I speak, that I would not um, uh, make, make it less clear than it should be. And I pray that you'd use this time to encourage us and help us to go away um, from this time, uh, having heard you and being reminded or being told for the first time this really important truth we're learning today. In Jesus' name, amen. And it is, it is really good to see you. Um, I like Blake was saying, um, I look forward to this time. It's, it's really obviously not church as normal, but uh, it is good to be here. Um, <clears throat> I've noticed uh, today the change in temperature from a few days ago. Uh, a few days ago, it was sunny, summer-like, balmy, t-shirt weather, shorts. And today, um, I went for a bit of a picnic with some family, um, my son's birthday sort of celebration, just, um, you know, five people, no, no, not a big party. And it was winter-like, wintry wind, freezing. And it's a little bit like that in this chapter, chapter nine. Uh, chapter eight ends with this great confidence of God's Holy Spirit looking after us and keeping us and how we can be secure in the love of Christ. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Very positive. And then in chapter nine, obviously the chapters were added later, but in this next section, we have Paul with this very strong concern for his fellow um, Israelites, his fellow Jews, which is lovely. Concern is beautiful, but it's not really up. It's, it's full of great sorrow. He's, he's concerned and he's full of anguish um, for his um, fellow Israelites, his Jewish um, friends who aren't yet Christian. Now, obviously, lots of Jewish people have become Christian, including Paul himself. The story of Paul's testimony from turning from uh, somebody who hated Jesus and all he stood for and went out to stone Christians, people who followed Jesus, because he, he thought they were heretics. He thought they were actually bringing God's name down into the mud, quite literally. That's what he thought. And so he went around to try and kill other Christians, and he was soundly converted. He started following Jesus. Remember the story on the road to Damascus? He has a bright light. He sees he's blinded, and the Lord Jesus himself speaks to him and says, why are you persecuting me? And uh, through that, he comes to trust Jesus as the Messiah and follows him. He's Jewish, and he's seen other Jewish people. I mean, the, the original disciples, of course, all Jewish. Jesus himself is Jewish. Uh, when you're a Christian, you're following a Jewish Messiah. You just need to get that right. Paul is very clear about that. Paul is writing this letter to the Romans, and there's a mixture of Jewish background people and non-Jewish background people. And he's just told that wonderful story in the first chapter eight, uh, first chapters of um, Romans that we've looked at. Fantastic stuff, stuff we could go back and look at again, and there'd be more depth there we'd get more out of. It's a it's beautiful um, um, section of literature we've already looked at, the uh, biblical literature. And here in chapter 9, he has this sorrow. He wants them to come and believe in Christ. And he says, if it was possible, I could be cut off. I could be damned for the sake of my um, Jewish friends. I I'd love to do that. that. That is, he's offering himself. Now, that's exactly what Christ did, of course. Jesus offered himself so we could be saved. Jewish and non-Jewish people could come to trust him and be saved. And um, Paul is, is moved to the point where he wants, he wants them to come to forgiveness, um, that they can be proclaimed right, they can be justified, uh, they can have the hope of glory, just like he does and all of us who follow Christ and the people who are reading the book of Romans initially in the, in the church, church there. Um, the people of Israel, you see, had great benefits. Um, uh, see that in the first five verses um, in that passage as um, Will read to us. He, first of all, I'll read verse two. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, says Paul for his Jewish friends. I would wish I could be cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. And then he lists the, the positives. He says, theirs is the adoption of sons. Now, they've been chosen to be the children of God, the people of Israel. They're the chosen, special chosen people. Um, of all the nations of the world, the Jewish people were chosen and uh, set apart to be a representative um, of what God is like in the world. And that's a story of, you remember the calling of Abraham? He becomes uh, the one who listens to God. He, he sees and relates um, with God. 
um, and he becomes a great father of the wonderful story, the great patriarch. And so they're, they're called um, the sons or the children. There's the divine glory. That is, they, they got to see God. Remember in the story of um, the Exodus, for example, the um, tower of um, cloud and the pillar of fire at night and uh, the holy of holies, the inner temple, it's a Shekinah, the word is a glory of God. That comes through Israel, it comes from the Jewish people, it doesn't come from any other nation. So they've got great privilege. Um, so there's the adoption of sons or children, there's the divine glory, the covenants, the covenant of Abraham we've already talked about, and the covenant that God extends to David, and the covenants throughout the history of the Old Testament. There's the receiving of the law, the Ten Commandments. They get that. They get all the Levitical laws. They get the whole sacrificial system, which allows them to worship. The temple of worship is the next one. And the promises, the great promises of what God is going to do. Now, when we read the Old Testament, as Christians, we can see all those promises are met in Jesus. Without Jesus, um, there's no fulfillment of the Old Testament. Without the Old Testament, there's no understanding of Jesus. And, and Paul is... He sees this as a Jewish person who's come to faith and he's in anguish. He says, oh, if they could only see that the fulfillment of everything they believe in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. I'd love if they could come to faith. So before we go any further, it's right for us um, to think of Jewish people. Uh, I know Mark and Rachel is uh, with us and there's some of you who have Jewish heritage. Uh, and we need to be thinking about in our area of Sydney, particularly where it's a very high percentage, a much higher than pretty much anywhere else in Sydney of people who have Jewish background. Um, some of them are secular Jewish people, they don't, that is, they don't really know the Old Testament. Lots of them are atheistic Jewish people, um, but they are Jewish and they are of the people of God, special chosen ones. And I think it's right to us to have a burden that these people, Old Testament um, uh, blessed people, should come to follow Christ and share what we have in Christ, just like Paul does. Um, uh, theirs is the, are the patriarchs. From them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, ever praised. Amen. So Jewish people probably accept that Jesus came, but and they probably accept he's Jewish, but they don't accept he's God. And Paul wants Jewish people, his Jewish um, fellow citizens of Israel, to come to recognize in, in Jesus, we have the Christ, the Messiah. In Jesus, we have the Son of God. In Jesus, we have God acting. And so he's in anguish. He's, he's concerned for them. He does this in, in um, uh, he introduces this idea in chapter 9. It goes 9, 10, and 11. And these three chapters, 9, 10, and 11, are difficult chapters as a result. Because as we read them as Gentiles, um, maybe in Bondi and our areas, we're a little bit different because we're a bit more aware of uh, Jewish people. But lots of Gentile Christians who read these chapters say, what's this talking about, Jewish? What are we, what, what's this story? How does this fit in? It fits in because um, Christ is Jewish. The disciples were Jewish. We believe in the Jewish scriptures. The Old Testament is Jewish. But the great thing is it, it doesn't stay Jewish. It opens up. And God chooses to show his mercy, not just to Jewish people, but the Gentiles. And the funny thing is, in this chapter, he says, actually, he shows his, his mercy to some Jewish people and some Gentiles, but not all. Paul is praying through this chapter um, that more people would come to understand God and believe in God uh, through Jesus and come to, to mercy. So that's, that's a little bit of the background um, uh, in, this, uh, or in this introduction here. So these chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, are well recognised as difficult chapters uh, in, the, um, in, in the book of Romans. And actually, I've been in churches, and I, actually I've been a little guilty of this myself, when, I, when I've heard sermon series that go through Romans, and they might get up to chapter 8, and then it just, it's just sort of convenient not to do 9, 10, and 11. And then when they start the, the series again, we start at verse, uh, chapter 12. In fact, if you, talk, if you talk chapters 9, 10, and 11 out and just splice the, um, chap, the end of chapter 8 up to chapter 12, it sort of makes sense and sort of works pretty well. Chapter 12 is a wonderful chapter. I can't wait to get to it. But there's these difficult chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, dealing with how Jewish faith and Jewish, Jewish sort of backgrounds to Jesus and, and how that all fits in. It, 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 is God still 
um, the God over Israel? Are the Jewish people still specially chosen? What about the Gentiles? How do they fit in now? And uh, Paul is attempting to answer that, probably because in the Roman churches, uh, there were Jewish people asking questions and Gentile Christians asking questions about how the Jewish thing fits in. And we ask those questions too. But the other thing that makes them difficult is, is this whole idea of God's choice. Uh, and uh, there's some good examples of how people who fixate on this word choice or predestination and make a whole system up, um, which is unhelpful. But that's not to say predestination or choice is an unhelpful thing by definition. It's not. It's there. It's biblical. It's, it's, it's very strong in Romans. It's in these chapters in particular. But you could go into many, many passages of the Bible which talk, talks about God's choice, God's, God's sovereign choice. That's what makes him God. Um, God's will is far more powerful than my will. Um, I can choose to do certain things and I, I, can, I can, in my experience, feel that I'm making choices. I can choose to pick up this pen. I've picked up this pen. I'm choosing to put it down again. I can choose to look straight into the camera and hopefully you're looking at me. I've made those choices. But I can't choose to change the colour of my eyes. I can't choose to be born in Africa because I wasn't. I can't choose who my siblings are. I can't choose a whole lot of things. I can choose to eat healthily or unhealthily to a certain extent because I've got the money. Some people can't choose that. Some people can't choose to eat because they haven't got any money or any access to food. I have got a lot of choice, but it's not completely free. My choice is not free. What God's choice is, is so much bigger than mine. And he sets up the background. Uh, and as a result, he, he chooses who is born where. He chooses who gets access to certain information, who doesn't. So that's, that's just stating a philosophical truth, which Paul is, is um, using in one sense to undergird this. As a result, it's a fairly, um, uh, can get a bit academic and you can have a distortion of this view of predestination. I'll give you an example of a distortion of this view of election. Oh, God's cho chosen everybody, so I don't have to bother telling anybody at all. Well, that's not Paul's view, isn't it? He's in anguish about his Jewish brothers and sisters who aren't yet Christians. He wants them to come and, and it fills him with sorrow. So when we think about God's choice, it doesn't mean we become inactive or uncaring. That's a distortion. <clears throat> what it does mean is we recognise that God is powerful and God is worthy of our praise and God is the one who actually achieves it. It's all through God's activity. That's, that's what we've seen already, actually, in Romans. It's God's activity, not our activity, which saves us. Um, it, we, we can only follow Christ because of what God has made possible for us. So uh, that's, that's the story. Um, those great blessings in, in the first five verses that the Jewish people have seem fantastic. So... So what's the problem then? Why aren't they on the whole? Some of them have come to Christ, including Paul, but why don't they on the whole, um, the majority of them, come to follow Christ? Is there something wrong? No. Paul explains that just being Jewish does not make you saved, does not save you. See, verse 6, let me just say that again. Verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. What's he saying here? Well, he's basically saying having all the benefits of being born in Israel, Israelite is not enough to save you. You can't rest on that as the laurels is what gets you in. It actually needs more. And the, the picture uh, given um, is then the story of Isaac and, and Ishmael. There's two sons. He gives two stories, two stories of two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, and then Jacob and Esau in the next few verses. Um, those of you who don't know the story of Isaac and Ishmael, basically Abraham in his old age and Sarah uh, told they're going to have children and they're very old. And they think, well, that's news to us because we thought that it all passed us. We'd passed that stage. And uh, last year, I think it was the beginning of last year, Blake gave a great sermon on this and um, he talks about Abraham solving it himself in his own strength. And he says, well, if I'm going to have a son, I better go and have one. And so he, he finds another lady to have a son with, Hagar. And he has a son, Ishmael. He says, now, that's the promise. But it's not the promise. Because that was his effort, you see. 
And so he has to wait for the, the, the promise to actually come to fruition through God. And so uh, Sarah, who, who, who is too old to have a son, has a son, and his name is called Isaac. So Isaac, which means laughter, or he makes me laugh, um, is, the, is the child of promise. And it's that way with faith in Jesus. It's what God does. It's God's initiated, not us. So it's not what we do as a Jewish person or a Gentile person. Um, it's initiated that um, actually saved us. So that's the first uh, story, Jacob and Esau. Uh, sorry, so Ishmael and Isaac. And then we have the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, other two sons, they're twins. Remember the story? So they're, they're the uh, son of um, Isaac. Isaac grows old, very, very old. And um, his, his, uh, two, his twin sons come. The eldest is Esau, and then there's Jacob. But there's a prophecy that is made before they're born that um, the, young, the younger um, will lead the older. The older will serve the younger. So somehow Jacob, who shouldn't really get the blessing, is a slightly younger son. They're twins, the slightly younger son, ends up being the one who receives the blessing. And then there's a great story. It's, it's full of um, intrigue and um, lying and deceit and treachery. And actually, Jacob and Esau both come up looking pretty bad, actually. I don't think we could argue that Jacob is, a, is better and that's why he's chosen. It's not. It's just God chose. God made the decision. It's, he's elected or chosen it to come through Jacob. So Jacob becomes a child of blessing. And then, of course, he becomes the father of um, his ch name changes from Jacob to Israel. Jacob to Israel. He's the same person. And Israel just means the one who's seen God. I've seen God. Remember, he has a dream of uh, a staircase with angels going up and down, ascending and descending. And he has uh, um, uh, 12 sons and the youngest, um, Benjamin, and the other, other son, um, Joseph. We have the story of going down to Egypt. It's all, all very complex. But here, uh, the point is that Jacob is the younger one. He receives a blessing. Why? Because God. That's it's all because of God. Let me just get through that quickly in verse 10. It says this. Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, as it is written Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. Some of you are saying the word hated there, you're getting a bit nervous. It doesn't mean God actively hated him. It's just in contrast to being chosen. Um, he, he was he 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 um, was not chosen to be the 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 one who brought the blessing. So that's just biblical, right? The old year of God's choosing. It's part of what God makes um, God God. When we pray thanks to God, we thank you for giving us food. Why does He give us food? Because we deserve it? No, because He chooses to. When we pray thanks to God, please God. Get me out of this scrape. Do we think that that's dependent on us? No, it's completely dependent on God. He can change everything. All the contingencies God can change because he is sovereign. That's why we pray to him. His will is completely free. The only thing God is not free to do is to go against his character. He's not free to do evil. He's not free to become the devil. He's not free to go against his word. What he has promised, he will achieve. And so that gives us great hope. Uh, that's part of our hope. That's why we love God, because he's, he's an all-powerful God, but he's also all-holy. And that's what makes us undeserving, because we're not all-powerful. We're weak, and we're not holy. We're reliant. We need to rely on God's choice. God's will is greater than our will. God's character is greater than our character. God's ability is so much greater than our ability. God chooses and can choose, and we can't choose. We're, we're locked. We're naturally locked in a slavery to self-centeredness. We're naturally locked, and our vision is myopic. Our vision is very limited. We can't really see the way things are. But God, as a creator, is the one who sees everything as it really is. And he's not constrained. He can choose whatever he wants within his character. He chooses all sorts of things that allows us to benefit from his character and his, his bountiful goodness. That's what we've seen in uh, the first eight chapters. And in chapter nine, he's just reflecting upon 
the background in the Old Testament and his Jewish um, brothers and sisters. It's part of his will that we um, are shown mercy as he chooses us. He chooses to show mercy. We don't deserve mercy. That's the whole point of God's goodness and God-likeness is his choice of those he wants to save. Anyone God shows mercy to does not deserve it. So those who are shown mercy, who receive his mercy, it is by definition a gift, a free gift. Verse 14 asks that question, then, well, is, is God unjust or unfair because some are chosen and some are not? No, it is all God's purpose. And we really can't ask any question. We can't ask that question. Let me read verse 14 for you. It says this, <clears throat> what then shall you say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For as he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I have have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. You see that? It's not, a, it's not a matter of deserving. It's just sheer mercy. In fact, if it was just on deserving, if God acted on what was deserving, none of us would get there. Remember chapter three? No one seeks after God. No, not one, says chapter three. And Paul says it in chapter three, way back. So if you want justice, if you want what is deserving, you're actually wanting to be cut off from God forever. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. To receive mercy, to be chosen, to have extended God's mercy to us is a great, great privilege, a great blessing. And that's what makes it good news because we are chosen. Now, um, uh, that's the first point that we really need to get across. But we do need to be careful here. I just want to underline this. Um, I actually have seen a, an example of this distortion. Some people try and work out who have been chosen by God. You can't really do that. You can't really work that out beforehand. We can have a guess in retrospect. That is, I guess, people here who are engaged with the Bible and are wanting to follow Jesus who pray, who exhibit change in their lives, which, are, which is brought about by the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful thing you're, if you're in Christ. But you can't look around and say, I wonder who's chosen here. Some people appear to be the type that God would not show mercy to. They, they almost seem like they're too hard to crack for all sorts of reasons, social reasons. Our own prejudice would make us think this person is less, like, less likely to be saved or chosen than that person. But you know what? We're so often so wrong. We have to be very, very careful. And that is why we're generous and gospel-like to everyone that we come across. We're kind to everyone we come across. Firstly, because God wants that in our lives. It's a good thing in itself. But also, he wants us to be beacons of hope to those people who we come in contact with. That's what Israel's role was too. Israel was meant to be a light on the hill that all the other nations looked to and were attracted to God and came to trust God. That's what the Old Testament was saying Israel should be. And unfortunately, they by and large failed. And that is, even when the Messiah came, lots of the leaders of Israel, the religious people of Israel, rejected Jesus. They rejected the very source of their salvation and the focus of what should have been their worship. We have to be careful too that we don't um, use this election, this um, predestination um, idea um, to, to uh, develop this sort of religious sort of um, uh, ideology where we think they're chosen and they're not chosen. We don't know, actually, we don't know. All we know is those who say they trust and follow Christ uh, and those who are in Christ can benefit from those great things, the mercy of Christ, the free mercy of Christ, the grace that comes from Christ, being declared just, being declared justified, being made righteous, and um, looking forward to the great glory that is to be revealed. That's what we have in Christ. But we don't know who's chosen. The only one who knows is God because he does the choosing. We don't. Sometimes we look around and we look at some people and think, oh, they're unlikely to need mercy. Um, they're pretty good people. I don't really need to share the gospel to them. You see, the other we can write people off and we can also put people on a pedestal, maybe because they're educated, 
maybe because they're very religious, maybe because they've become to church for a long time, maybe because they've got good manners, maybe because we just like them. They like we like the way they roll, you know, they're att attractive to us. We think, ah, oh, I don't really need to share the gospel with them. Maybe we we don't have that sense of sorrow that Paul has for his Jewish people who he knows aren't saved for our friends. Maybe our friends we like socializing with, but we don't want to actually offer Christ to them. You see, how does God show his choice of people? Well, we've seen in, in, in Romans already, it's through hearing the gospel. Later on, we'll see that the only way people are saved is they hear the truth of the gospel. We've already seen in chapter one, uh, uh, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save those who are lost. That's how he chooses to extend his mercy, through hearing the gospel. That's how I became a Christian. And if you're a Christian, that's how you became a Christian too, through hearing or reading or finding out about the truth of Jesus. Our message is free grace, free mercy, because of Christ's work. And so we have to be careful we don't make this, this election um, theology, which is, I think, biblical. I don't think you can argue it's there in the Bible. We have to be careful we don't make it this big systematic thing which becomes just a cognitive thing which we argue about. Are you chosen or not? What does it mean to be chosen? Um, is it my will or God's will? Well, it's God's will, but you've got a will. God's will never, never rides over our will. Um, it's just our will is constrained already by where we're born and whether we hear the gospel, whether we've got the Bible presented to us or not. And God has given us a will. And sometimes our will is to not go and tell other people about Jesus. Well, you shouldn't. You shouldn't have that response. Your response should be, I want to live in a way which attracts other people to Jesus. And I want to do my bit by being faithful. It doesn't mean you want to be evangelists. But I think we should be feeling the weight of uh, what we've been given. Uh, Paul then quotes um, from the story of the Exodus um, a great story about um, how God speaks to Moses. Well, I've just quoted it then, but let me just say it again. I'll, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on human will or uh, exertion, but on God who has mercy. That's, that, that's spoken to Moses when he's up on Mount Sinai. He's just received the Ten Commandments, and he hears a loud, loud noise, and he looks down, and he can see all the people of Israel. Instead of worshipping God, they've created a calf, a golden calf, a, a statue they've melted all the earrings that they stole from the egyptians and um or that they took from egypt and they've made this beautiful uh, looking um calf and they said this is the god who brought you out of egypt and they start worshiping that idol and moses filled with dread and he think oh no god you're going to wipe them out and he, he prays just like paul prays in the beginning of this chapter wipe me out god don't wipe them out i'll i'll i'll, I'll go in their stead and, um, and God says, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. I'll show compassion. And he shows compassion to Israel. He keeps his promise to Israel and he doesn't wipe them out. Um, God chose to show mercy. God chooses to show mercy. That's part of his nature. And then he talks about Pharaoh and how, how Pharaoh hardened his heart or God hardened Pharaoh's heart. When you look in the Exodus story, you see actually Pharaoh hardened his heart. So both of them, Pharaoh's hardening his heart and God's allowing his heart to be hardened. Why? So his glory would be revealed. Remember the 10 plagues and the story of the great Exodus? Um, uh, that, that's all, all, also used as an example by Paul here to highlight the fact that God will use all the circumstances to achieve his purposes. And just as a footnote here, uh, I, think, I think we need to remember at this time that our circumstances might be very pushed and constrained. We might be feeling a bit flat. Uh, maybe, maybe there's issues we feel we've got no control over. Chances are you're probably right. You probably have no control over them. Trust God. He will achieve these, uh, his, his will. Sometimes it's going to be hard for us. Trust God because God will show mercy and God will look after you uh, as you're in Christ. Um, well, it all seems a little bit hard. Sometimes it seems a little bit um, like this is not fair. And uh, he responds to that question too. Look at verse 19. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who resists his will? That is, we've got no control of it. What, what, are we culpable still? And the answer is, <clears throat> you can't tell God what to do. It's back to base one. That is, do you understand what we mean when we say God? 
It's a little bit of, re of a rebuff. It's very hard teaching. But there's one we need to hear. When we ask questions, God, you're not fair. You're not fair. You're allowing me to suffer. God, why are you allowing me to go through this? One of the answers, one of the biblical answers is, I am God. Do you trust me or not? And then there's an illustration about um, a lump of clay. And it's a biblical understanding. It's um, used by Jeremiah and it's also used by Isaiah. If you look at those passages in your footnotes, you'll see them. But it's basically the metaphor of a pot which is molded by a potter. It's beautiful. But sometimes the potter might say, you know what? I don't like that shape and smash it all up again and start again. And a pot can't say to the potter, hey, why have you made me like this? Or I haven't got any handles or I want it to be a different shape or can you put a bit more water in the... No, no, no. I'm the potter, you are the clay, says God. And that is a little bit of a response. It sounds harsh, but it's a little bit of a response we need to hear. Every, as we trust in the gospel, as we know that God can show mercy to whomever he wants to show mercy, we also recognise that God will do what he wants to do. He'll arrange the situation. Now, there's certain things we do have control over, and within our constraints, we can, we can improve our situation. Nothing wrong with that. We can work out, hey, just wait, if I get another part-time job, I can earn a bit more money. It means I can buy a bit nicer food or a better, better car or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but sometimes we do our best. We still can't change anything. Trust God. He will look after you. Um, Denny, Denny, again, he quotes um, uh, uh, the, um, oh, the, the passage of um, the potter is to highlight the fact that he is working out his purposes in the Jewish people and in the non-Jewish people the Jewish people and the Gentiles. He's achieving his purposes. And then right at the end, he quotes again from another Old Testament prophet, Hosea. It's a wonderful story, Hosea. Um, why does he quote from him? Because Hosea is told to go out and marry a loose woman, a real floozy, um, a prostitute. Marry this woman who, who is very um, uh, promiscuous. And he marries this woman and uh, she has a bunch of kids. And... Um, Hosea is pretty sure they're not his kids, if you know what I mean. And so his kids are called not my people or, or, or um, you know, you cause me grief. And they become a parable because those people, are, their names are changed. Um, I will call them my people who are not my people and I'll call, call her my loved one who is not my loved one. That is, it's a picture of what God does with us. We're naturally not deserving of God's mercy. That as those of us who've come to Christ, we've, we've, we um, have been called his people who naturally are not his people. And so what, what is this whole bit cho chosenness about? It's meant to fill us with gratitude, first of all, that we're not deserving, yet we've been extended, God's mercy is extended to us. Isn't that fantastic? I'm so glad that I've heard the gospel. I'm so glad I heard that it's in Jesus that I can find mercy. It's in Jesus that I can find forgiveness. It's in Jesus that I actually can have that great hope. It's in Jesus that I've been declared right. It's in Jesus that I have no condemnation. It's in Jesus that I look forward to be glorified. It's in Jesus that I, I can get up and know that God is good, even when it's a little bit not brilliant with the circumstances. It's in Jesus that I have that hope because he has called my people, called us, his people, even though we're naturally not his people. And that extends to both Jewish people, some Jewish people, and some Gentiles. Now, there's a second reason we can enjoy it. First of all, that's a great thing. Second thing is, how will other people come to experience and receive that great offer of mercy? It's through hearing the gospel. And we'll see that later on in Romans, that pitch picks up. Uh, there's many, many things to be said about um, the relationship with Israel and, um, and the Gentiles, um, and we'll look at that in chapter 11 and 12. But I think one of the big applications is this. Pray for others. Have an anguish for people who you know are not yet Christian, just like Paul did for his Jewish um, brothers and sisters. For Jewish people and for Gentile people, let's pray for them. I think we should pray particularly for Mark and Rachel as they reach out to Jewish people and other, other Jewish Christians who have come to trust in Jesus as the Messiah and see him as the result and the fulfillment of the Old Testament. 
Um, in a few weeks, Mark and Rahel are going to present at church, so I look forward to that. That'll be great in October. I think they're going to do that. So uh, please pray for them. But also pray for our Gentile friends um, who aren't yet Christian, people who we love relating to, who are lovely people. You know what? If they're lovely people, that's great. But if they're not saved, that's really sad. And for our people who aren't so lovely and we think, oh, I don't really want to spend time with them, if they're not Christian, we need them to come. Work in their lives. Pray for an opportunity to share about Jesus. And for maybe other people who, who we're not really sure about, just live good lives amongst them and offer God's grace. Um, I feel the sorrow for those who have not yet um, heard about God's offer of mercy to them, that they would receive mercy and that they would be chosen by God to come into the family, to come into Christ. Let me pray again. Heavenly Father, thanks again for this word. Thank you for uh, the truth of uh, your power. Uh, Lord, there's lots of ideas in here that um, challenge us a little bit, but we thank you that it's through your choice, it's through your work, it's through your grace, it's through your mercy, and not through anything we offer. It's a good reminder, and I pray that we'd be able to offer that to friends and family, people we interact with who are not yet in Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'd please extend your mercy to them too. In Jesus' name, amen.